So how do we route signals within a standard cell ASIC? So this is how a standard cell ASIC would look like. Of course, this is an oversimplified ASIC because it contains a very small number of cells. Uh, the cells are arranged in rows. Uh, the rows will not contain the same number of cells, but the number of cells will depend on uh, the width of each, each cell. Uh, the pitch of the cells, which is their height, would be the same uh, because that's the definition of a standard cell, but their width will differ depending on complexity. When we arrange the cells next to each other, because of the conditions we put on the layouts of standard cells, uh, their ground and supply rails will abut and they will form a complete ground and supply rail that runs across the width of the entire standard cell row. The same happens for the wells. They uh, join together and form a, a complete, like a big well together. Around the perimeter of the ASEC, we have uh, an empty, uh, a piece of empty real estate which uh, will be used to form uh, bonding pads uh, for the pins of the chip. In between the rows of standard cells we have, uh, uh, we have metal tracks. These are usually in the metal one layer. These tracks are used to do horizontal routing and we'll see how that is done. Uh, the way we distribute the particular cells to particular locations and then decide how to route them is an important part of the uh, design flow, which we'll consider at a later video. But um, when we arrange the cells next to each other, sometimes the uh, tool that does the routing needs to uh, leave an, an opening between the cells so that the row is not complete. This opening is often used for routing. In such a case, the, uh, the, the tool can make a decision about how to handle the wells and the power supply uh, and ground rails. Either it will complete them uh, in the uh, empty position or it will have to route them from both sides. Now the question is, once we arrange the cells next to each other, how do we connect them together to give us the function that we want? Uh, what layers specifically do we use uh, to do the routing? And so these are the layers that we have available, beginning from the lowest to the highest. Uh, so we have the diffusion layer, which is uh, the active layer. It forms N plus and P plus. Uh, this is never used actually to do any kind of long range routing uh, because of its resistance. However, we can use it uh, to create single diffusion strips as we did with the older path. This is done within a, uh, a cell when we are designing the layout of the standard cell itself. Uh, polysilicon lines uh, are used for in-cell routing within the cell, uh, again, to connect the gates of transistors uh, just to save uh, um, on real estate for contacts. Uh, sometimes it's used, it's used for uh, routing between cells in the same row. Uh, this is only done when we have um, processes with less than three metal layers. When we do have more than three metal layers, which is uh, more than two metal layers, which is usually the case, we will never use polysilicon to route outside the cell. Metal one is used to uh, route supply uh, and ground. It's used for horizontal metal tracks between rows of standard cells. It's used within the cells to uh, route, um, to connect the circuit within the cell. Uh, metal two is used to do local con connections within the row uh, when more than three metal layers are available. And it's used to make uh, vertical connections between rows in, uh, in processes where there are not more than uh, two layers available. Metal 3 um, and all the way up to the next to the highest metal layer uh, is used for generalized routing. Uh, it's usually used for long range routing. Uh, the higher the metal layer, uh, the longer the routing should be. This is normally vertical routing. When we talk about routing in this case, we are talking about vertical routing. The highest metal layer is usually reserved to distribute uh, supply and ground. So if we look at like the uh, at routing within the same uh, row of, of cells, uh, when we do not have more than two metal layers, we have to use polysilicon and metal one to do uh, routing within the same row. In this case, routing is going to be very complicated by the fact that both these layers 
are also used to do routing within the cells themselves. So we have to uh, keep using them to avoid making intersections that we do not want. However, when we have more than two metal layers available, we can use metal two and metal one to perform routing within the same row of cells. If we are only using metal two, it can be used liberally and we can stop worrying about creating any unwanted intersections. Remember when we talked about standard cell layout design and even stick diagrams, we said that inputs and outputs have to be provided in the metal one layer. This allows us to uh, always contact the inputs and outputs of the standard cell using vias to metal two and then use metal two to do routing within the same layer. Now, when we want to do routing between um, between cells that are not in the same row, well, we are going to use vertical tracks of metal as well as the horizontal tracks which are available between uh, the cell rows. So between the cell rows, we have uh, tracks in metal one layer, we will use a higher metal layer if we are using metal two to do, inter, uh, uh, to do routing within the same row, we will use metal three. This allows metal three to uh, cross over or pass over uh, rows of standard cells without creating any intersections. And then this can be used to make contacts with uh, the uh, horizontal metal one um, jumpers so that we can create a contact for example, between cell Y and cell X, also between cell B and cell A, without creating any intersections between them. This is because the vertical line connecting X to Y is not going to intersect with the horizontal line connecting B to A and vice versa. So using this approach, where we use a higher metal layer for vertical routing, uh, makes routing a, a much simpler process. One more thing about routing uh, has to do with routing supplying ground because these are special signals. We cannot treat them like normal uh, logic signals. Uh, when we abut cells together, we expect them to form a continuous uh, supplying ground rail, which they do. However, if we have a longer row of standard cells, the rows do not have to be the same length, by the way. So if we have a longer row of standard cells, the tool has to thicken the supply and ground rails for that for that row. So the longer the row, the thicker the supply and ground rails. Why? Because metal lines will have resistive drop, even if it is small because of the uh, conductivity of metal, because of the long length of metal uh, of, of uh, supply rails and because of the amount of current drawn through them, there will be resistive drops. This means that the last cell in the row will see a lower value for supply than the first cell in the row and we'll see a higher value for ground than the first cell in the row um, unless we make the wire uh, wider which is the case here so let's take a deeper look at how supply and ground are distributed this is uh, like an example of a standard cell uh, ASIC we have rows of standard cells arranged in blocks we have uh, VDD and ground running horizontally at top and the bottom uh, in a higher metal layer. This is usually the highest metal layer. And then we have metal one feeding supplying ground to the standard cell rows. We have uh, metal two, for example, running uh, vertically. Uh, and there's of course a lot of vias or contacts here to establish a connection between this vertical line and the horizontal lines. Uh, they distribute the supplying ground vertically, which can then be used to provide ground and supply to the specific standard cell rows. Uh, this approach will lead uh, to drops, and the drops will be uh, highest for specific cells. For example, uh, vertically, when we distribute uh, supply, the supply will be lowest at the bottom, and because we are distributing it horizontally, it will be lowest for um, this particular cell, this particular cell, and this particular cell. They will see the lowest value for supply. Uh, uh, similarly for ground, we'll see the highest value for ground near the top because that's where the largest drop will be observed and we'll observe uh, the largest value for ground also near the uh, left end of the row of standard cells. So in, an improvement on this is to actually provide supply and ground both at the bottom and the top and in this case we are um, just sorting this line to this line through this vertical uh, uh, metal wire uh, 
And what this does is it reduces the amount of drop to almost half and the maximum amount of drop vertically that will be observed will be seen uh, in the middle rows of standard cells. Again, supply will be the worst near the uh, right end of, of the blocks and ground will be worst near the left end of the blocks. Uh, the best way, well, I mean second to best way to distribute supply and ground is to do a ring which surrounds the standard cells. This way the maximum drop is observed near the middle. Um, of course, the more metal we use to distribute supply and ground, the less uh, drop we see because of the less resistance, but the more real estate we use. Uh, in practical chips, supply and ground would actually be distributed by an entire plane of, of metal uh, at a higher layer to reduce the amount of drop as much as possible.